In this lesson, we're going to take a look at vertical asymptotes, one property that a function can have that we can study using limits. We'll start by taking a look at a limit definition of a vertical asymptote, and then we'll see how we can find these analytically using a definition of a function. Let's take a look at that definition. To begin, let's look at an example, and then we'll see how we can use that to get an idea of how to define vertical asymptotes using limits. Recall from maybe pre-calculus that informally, we can say that a vertical asymptote is a vertical line that a function's graph approaches more and more closely without ever quite touching the line. And you can already maybe see some limit type vocabulary in here. And so what we typically see near a vertical asymptote, if we're looking at the graph of a function, is that the graph moves very quickly up or down the coordinate plane. An example of a function that has a vertical asymptote is the one over x squared function. Here's a graph of it. And here the line x equals zero, which is just the y-axis, is a vertical asymptote. And as we move our x coordinates closer and closer to zero, we see that the graph of the function is getting closer and closer and closer to that asymptote, the y-axis here, but never quite touching it. You can see it kind of shooting up the coordinate plane very quickly as it does that. Let's see how we can define vertical asymptotes by using limits. We're going to use the concept of a limit involving infinity to do this. Here's what we can say. We'll say that the line x equals a, which is going to be some vertical line going through all the points that have a as the x coordinate, that line is a vertical asymptote of some function f if, now there are a few possibilities here. Here's the first one. The limit as x approaches a from the right of our function is infinity. Or the limit as x approaches a from the right of the function could be negative infinity. We can also talk about limits as we approach a from the left and get either positive or negative infinity. Any one of these four conditions is enough to make the line x equals a a vertical asymptote of the function. Now, in practice, most functions have these two at a time usually one involving a limit from the left and then the other one involving the limit from the right. Um, so there are some functions where you only have one or the other, but most of the time you'll have both of these. An infinite limit approaching a number from the left and an infinite limit approaching a number from the right. And any one of these is enough to give the function a vertical asymptote at the line x equals a. So let's take another look at the vertical asymptote of the one over x squared function that we just examined. There's the graph once more. And notice that as we approach zero from the left, that is working our way from left to right, starting over to the left side of the y-axis, the graph is moving further and further and further up the coordinate plane. So as we continue getting closer and closer to where x equals zero, our y coordinates are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, moving in the positive direction. Hence, that limit is infinite, and that alone establishes x equals zero as a vertical asymptote of the function. It's also the case here that as we approach zero from the right, the function values approach positive infinity. So this is a case where we have two of those vertical asymptote conditions met at once. And so because at least one of these is true, we have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Notice that zero is the value that we're letting x approach to get these asymptotes. That's how we know the asymptote is at x equals zero. Let's take a look at one more example, this time involving the one over x function. Here's the graph of this function. It, has some of the similar features, some similar features to what we just saw, but now you see that on each side of that vertical asymptote, again, it's the y-axis or the line x equals zero, the graph is moving in opposite directions. We can describe that using limits. So here, the limit as we approach or as x approaches zero from the right is positive infinity. You can see that as we move from the right, working our way to the left, the graph is moving further and further and further up the coordinate plane. But in this case, unlike in our last example, the limit as x approaches zero from the left 
is negative infinity. So in this case, we get slightly different limit behavior on each side of the asymptote, but again, because these limits are infinite, either positive or negative infinity, we have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Now let's turn to how to find vertical asymptotes analytically, so we don't have to rely just on looking at a graph of a function every time. There's a kind of step-by-step -step method that you can use to do this. You might recall this from pre-calculus or something like that. Here's what to look for. We get a vertical asymptote in a quotient function where we're dividing one function by another at values of x or whatever our independent variable is that make the denominator zero, but not the numerator. So given that, here's a way to find the vertical asymptotes of the function. First, simplify the function expression as much as possible. And since we're dealing with quotient functions here, the way to simplify is to cancel factors that are common to the numerator and the denominator. So start by simplifying the function, factor the numerator and the denominator if you can, and then cancel any common factors that you find. Then, look for values of x where the simplified denominator is equal to zero. Those values of x will be where we have vertical asymptotes. And because you've already canceled common factors, you can be sure that those values of x that you find in step two do not make the numerator zero. So that's an easy step-by-step -step method for finding vertical asymptotes. Let's take a look at an example of how to apply it. We're going to find the vertical asymptotes of this quotient function here, defined by x squared plus 2x minus 35 over x squared minus 25. So there's our function expression. Let's start by simplifying this as much as possible. So I'll factor the numerator and the denominator. You can see that there's a common factor of x minus 5. It can be canceled, and that leaves us with the simplified fraction, x plus 7 over x plus 5. Now, the only value of x that makes that denominator zero is negative five. And that means that the only vertical asymptote of the function will be the line x equals negative five. That's what we were looking for. One thing you might ask is what about x minus five, the factor we canceled in the denominator? What happens when x equals positive five? Well, we'll take a look at that. That's gonna be part of our study of continuity that we'll take on a little bit later in this course. Now, there can be some sort of special cases of vertical asymptotes where we can't use this method of simplifying by factoring. Here's an example. Think about the tangent function. You might recall from your study of trigonometry that the function defined by tangent of x has vertical asymptotes. In fact, it has infinitely many. How can you find them analytically? Well, one way to do this is to use a trigonometric identity. The tangent of x is equal to the sine of x over the cosine of x for all values of x. So think about the values of x that would make the cosine of x equal to zero. Some values of x are going to be pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, and this list can be extended indefinitely. The important thing to note here, though, is that the sine of x is not equal to zero at any of those. And that means each of those values of x that we've listed there and all the other ones we could add to that list are values of x that make the denominator of our function zero, but not the numerator. And that means that the tangent function is going to have vertical asymptotes at each of those x values. So we're still using the same method here to find vertical asymptotes, looking for places where the denominator is zero, but not the numerator. Here we just had to recall a trigonometric identity in order to think of the tangent function as a quotient function to which we can apply our method.